and Jack Howell. Friedrich Schiller wrote that only those who have the patience to do simple things perfectly will acquire the skill to do difficult things easily. If this statement resonates with you, you're probably going to enjoy this video. If it does not, thanks for giving it 30 seconds. We are about to go into hand position in excruciating detail. Even if you are enthusiastic about this, we should talk about why. But if you don't want to hear anything that's not Marcellus related, um, you could skip ahead two or three minutes, which is probably what the preamble will take. On the other hand, it's only two or three minutes. So unless you're uh, busy disarming a bomb or something, uh, maybe hear me out. Glenn Gould said that he didn't play piano with his fingers, he played with his mind. Robert Marcellus said that the clarinet clarinetist must always be thinking. However, thinking in the context of practicing and performing music means different things at different times. There is a difference between top-down focus, which uses the cortical region of our brain and is verbal, slow, and effortful, and bottom-up focus, which uses the subcortical region and is automatic, intuitive, and millisecond fast. We use top-down focus when we learn new skills and information. We use bottom-up focus to perform skills that we have learned and to perform them automatically, and uh, also to make new associations across our networks of, of information. There's a really good book that I recommend to students uh, called Focus, the Hidden Driver of Excellence by um, Daniel Goleman, G-O-L-E-M-A-N. It's not the only book that talks about this, um, but it's, it's a good read, so I recommend it. Now, I am speaking and you are listening using top-down focus. When a concert pianist performs, when a chess grandmaster plays, when NHL, NHL hockey players skate, that's bottom-up focus. The sub subcortical brain's uh, performing enormous magical feats of parallel computing, uh, orchestrating feats that are far beyond the speed and the bandwidth of verbal thought. Performers like this are able to relinquish verbal con control from their cortex and, um, and let the subcortical brain take over because they have achieved technical mastery. They are not unconscious in this state, although a lot of times we'll say that you're, this, that jazz player is out of his mind. Um, but they're, they're present. The musician is, is taking in musical information and making musical decisions. The athlete is seeing plays and, uh, and formations. But neither are they thinking verbally. Their technique, as Avram Galper said, money in the bank. What creates mastery is the amount of detail and concentration devoted in top-down focus with the cortex directing, specifying, refining an activity before that activity is turned over to the automatic bottom-up focus and done 5,000 times. And I used NHL skaters because I have, I have an example. Uh, my middle daughter's undergraduate roommate uh, was, before she retired and went to college, an elite Canadian junior hockey player, um, which in Canada is saying something. Uh, elite juniors are, that's like Olympic team, you know, they're, it's, it's, it's a really super high level. She was visiting over break one time and I, and I said, Nicola, let's figure out how much time you spent practicing skating. And we, we did the math, so many, so many hours per week, so many weeks, all this stuff, and we figured that between the time she started and the time she retired to go to college, she had spent 7,000 hours in skating drills. And this is not just skating for fun. She said they would hold an edge, hold an edge, hold an edge, hold an edge. So that's why hockey players can skate like birds fly. Um, Musicians are athletes of the small muscles, and as athletes, we must train in order to improve, and we must remain alert to avoid bad habits. 
the student who first learns a musical passage in a desultory manner, uh, makes a bunch of mistakes, then plays it over and over, hoping the mistakes will disappear, is unlikely to achieve mastery. The subcortical brain cannot perform its parallel computing without being programmed, and as any computer programmer will tell you, garbage in, garbage out. Uh, the TV golf teacher Martin Smith says, if you keep doing what you've been doing, you'll keep getting what you've been getting. And I think that's one of the big reasons for Robert Marcellus' success as a teacher, is that he convinced his students of the logic of attaining the utmost rudimentary precision during practice, then practicing until this precision became automatic. Marcellus often described his own early study with Earl Handland, Handlun, how they began with close mechanisms, very simple, very clear fingered with a Seth Thomas metronome, two notes per beat, four notes per beat. Very rigorous, top-down focus. Now, while some people do seem to learn things more easily than others, I believe that in the end, to quote David Faraday, successful people are the ones who are willing to do the work that unsuccessful people aren't. So, let's get to work. We get to work by talking about relaxation. Speed requires both relaxation and precision. Obviously, we are not totally relaxed when we play, but unnecessary, unproductive tension is to be avoided. Not only is a tense muscle a slow muscle, excess tension leads to injury. So, with everything that follows, we must feel and assess our level of tension. We want a light, springy feel to our hands, like the movements of a small bird. Now, when we talk about hand position, there are two aspects to it. First, forming your hands to the instrument in a way that promotes maximum accuracy, rhythm, and speed. The second aspect is thinking of musical phrases and passages in a way that anticipates correct notes in your hand position and eliminates incorrect ones. The second part, I think, is actually more important than the first, which is why we occasionally see a virtuoso with hands that look like live octopi. However, I think that everything is made easier if we first perfect our mechanism as much as we can. So let's start there. While I did not study directly with Robert Marcellus, I feel like I've studied with him indirectly my entire career. So he gets the credit. I risk giving Bill Jackson short shrift, but studying with Bill about four years after he left Northwestern, it was a rare lesson that I didn't hear Robert Marcellus says. And much of Marcellus goes back to Bernard, and much of Bernard goes back to Alexander Sommer, and, and so on. So uh, I'm not saying that it's original to Marcellus, but it's certainly not original to me. So here's what I have for many years called Marcellus's Three Finger Rules. Now, I'm taking some liberties. These are my synthesis. Robert Marcellus never said, I have three finger rules. But I learned these as Marcellus principles, and I find that arranging them into a three makes them more teachable. Um, and I encourage you to look up the archived recordings of Marcellus's master classes uh, at the Northwestern University uh, School of Music website. I also encourage any Marcellus students who happen to see this and, and, and uh, want to add or correct, uh, by all means, comment. So, first rule. I'm going to turn my phone on. First rule, the fingers must maintain a consistent curve. What Marcellus said varied somewhat over the years um, in his description of the curve to the fingers. Uh, early on, he said it was uh, like holding a tennis ball, and then at one point he said it was like the natural curve to your hands as, as, as they hang by your side. Uh, and there will be some variation according to hand size and finger length, but Marcellus was quite clear um, on the advantage of curved fingers over flat fingers. He spoke frequently of the relative strength of the arch compared to the beam. And keeping a curve to the hands enables rational use of the fingers that must operate more than one hole or key. I take the pinkies. 
If your pinky is straight, in order to move one from one key to the other, you must move your wrist. In order to move your wrist, you must move your forearm. So that moves your elbow, which moves your upper arm. And the next thing you know, you're moving your shoulder in order to, to change keys. And that's a lot of wasted motion. If you just simply change the curve in your pinky and maintain a curve, you don't have to move anything else. And by the way, Tommy Thompson's little finger circles that, that we talked about in the Airstream uh, drill video. Those are really good for this. Second rule. The fingers must move, whenever possible, only at the big knuckle. Marcellus spoke of quiet knuckles and of legato from the palm, a feeling of centralized control um, over relaxed, efficient finger motion while maintaining individual finger clarity. In engineering terms, this only makes sense. Um, if we want to create a precise, fast mechanism, we strive to reduce the number of moving parts. As the early, uh, early aviator and author of Little Prince, Antoine Saint-Exupéry, hope I pronounced that right, said that a, des a designer knows he has achieved perfection not when there is nothing left to add, but when there is nothing left to take away. So if, uh, if we are told to wiggle our fingers as fast as possible, we do this. Nobody does this. Uh, and beginners often have enough trouble hitting the, the holes to begin with. If you maintain a consistent curve and move only at the big knuckle, your fingers, the pad of your fingers, will infallibly hit the middle of the key. Third rule. The fingers must move up and down at exactly the same speed. Again, this only makes sense, but it's probably the most commonly violated rule I see in arriving students. Um, if we're striving for smooth rhythmic passages, it helps for each finger to be doing as nearly as possible exactly the same thing as its neighbors. Unlike the piano, moving a finger up changes the pitch just as much as putting it down. Moreover, sometimes when we raise our fingers, the pitch goes up, sometimes it goes down, and sometimes we must move two or more fingers in opposite directions to make the pitch go up or down. That is why it is beneficial to equalize the up and down motion in each finger. In this rule, there is inher inherent rhythm and inherent speed. M many students learn to make hand motions that contain approximately the correct notes, which can sound good, but only at one speed. With the Marcellus approach, passages will be smooth and even at any speed. In his 1982 master class, Marcellus said something like, and, and I'm paraphrasing, 95% of the people who come to me play out of rhythm. I don't think it's because they don't have a sense of rhythm. It's because they haven't built rhythm into this. And you can hear his hands clicking on the keys. If your fingers obey these three finger rules, the result will be clear, clean, rhythmic playing. And incidentally, I'm not a huge fan of trying to make an uneven passage even by playing dotted rhythms and, and exaggerating. It can work, but in my opinion, it's treating a symptom rather than curing the disease. If we have a technical problem, we wish to address it at the most fundamental level possible. If you train your fingers to move evenly, you will play passages evenly. Now, let's consider some additional hand position specifics. You will note that obedience to the first two rules dictates the placement of the thumb rest on the right thumb. Curve the hands, center the pads, not the tips, the pads on the holes, and the thumb falls naturally into the, the position uh, between the, the tip and, and, the, and the knuckle, between the nail and the knuckle. Um, young students, this position is what Marcellus taught. Young students often try to minimize the weight of the clarinet by cramming the thumb rest inboard, and you can see how this cramps the hand and, and makes a good curve to the fingers impossible. I think many uh, hand and finger issues could be avoided early on if students who are unable to support the clarinet without hooking the pinkies uh, or the index finger under keys uh, were, were given neck straps. Here's a picture of Mike Riznik, Ron Samuels, and me taken by photographer Todd Rosenberg somewhere on tour in Europe. If you look closely, you will see both subtle differences 
and fundamental similarities in our hand positions and in our overall postures. Notice how our wrists, elbows, and shoulders are in line with our hands, with our arms hanging more or less directly from our so shoulder sockets. That's directly related to hand position. If you find yourself playing with a sharp angle in your wrists or your, your elbows sticking out, you probably could improve your playing with better ergonomics, although initially it will feel uncomfortable simply because it's different. As Marcellus said, because of the variety in human configuration, some variety in hand position is to be expected, but the clarinet imposes limits. Look closely in the, in the picture at our left index fingers. In order to play smoothly across the break, the left index finger must be curved and angled so that it is capable of touching the F-sharp hole, the A key, and the G-sharp key sim simultaneously. That way we don't have to drag a whole hand around playing in the throat register. Many students learn a bad habit of playing a throat A or a B-flat with the tip of the index finger in the middle of the A key or playing G-sharp with, with the index finger pointing straight up. That makes it impossible to play a legato interval to any note except throat G or maybe F. So putting the, the fingers here creates a crevasse that must be jumped. And many students solve this problem by stopping the air while they jump it. So to, correct, to establish correct index finger position, left hand index finger position, Play a second register B using all of the hand position skills we've just covered while sustaining the B and not lifting the, the index fingertip from the F sharp hold to press the A and the G sharp keys alternately then together. Your index finger should live right there. Okay, right there. Um, and you, you'll find you don't have to uncover the F-sharp hole very much at all. I'll show that later. So when you play A or G-sharp and look in a mirror, if you see the F-sharp hole uncovered, um, you're out of position. And I, I encourage students to, to practice with a mirror. Your left thumb, just like the, the right thumb, is positioned uh, by the natural thumb forefinger opposition. If your left, left index finger curves to enable all three touches, your thumb should cross the thumb hole at an angle, sealing it with a fleshy pad and leaving just enough hanging over to operate the register key and or uncover the thumb hole by flexing the, the, the last joint of the thumb, not, not by, by sliding or hopping. And by the way, one of the many things I like about my uh, Yamaha Artist models is the slight extension of the register key. That makes it uh, easier to catch with a straight flexion of the thumb. So on to the right index finger, which is where so many uh, students get into trouble because they get in the habit of hanging the clarinet on it which simultaneously makes it impossible for the finger to operate correctly and makes the E-flat, B-flat key inaccessible. Um, this key is depressed not by pushing it with the fingertip, which drags the whole hand out of position, but by using the part of the finger that contacts it in good hand position. Now, if you have bad hand or, or hand position habits, it will be difficult to learn a new position while you are playing. Because while you're playing, you, you can't feel it. Most of your technique is already bottom-up. Bottom-up focus is unconscious, so the act of playing makes it impossible to feel what you're doing. Hand position changes, any changes really, take really serious top-down focus. So here's a drill. Finger second register B in the C major position, left pinky on the B, right pinky on the C. Okay, evaluate your hand position in the mirror. Are your fingers curved? Can the left index finger make all the touches? Can the right index finger touch the E-flat, B-flat side key without lifting? Okay, now turn your metronome on 60 beats a minute. Okay.
Without playing, take each finger in turn and obey the finger rules. Two notes per beat, then four notes per beat. Up, down, up, down, up, down, or one note, one note and then two bows. So up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. Move only the big knuckle, up and down exactly the same speed. Go through all the possible touches, including the trill keys and the sliver keys. Leaving all the other fingers down constrains the hand position. Um, it constrains each finger to move correctly and independently. Now, when you do this, you have to make sure that you don't revert to the position you're trying to change. Don't let your thumb crawl back under the rest. Don't let your right index finger collapse under, under the B-flat key. So, let's put this information to use. Many clarinetists are afraid of Mendelssohn's Midsummer Night's Dream Scherzo. And while the required articulation speed can indeed be a difficulty, students have a tendency to make the excerpt more difficult than necessary with bad hand position. So a lot of players take that first, the first two B naturals with the right hand trill key, and I'm not saying that's wrong, but the way I'm going to show, I think, is no harder, and it preserves better hand position. So check it out. With correct index finger placement, you only need to move two fingers for the first four bars, the index finger and the thumb. You can leave everything else down. Oop, there we go. And if you put your uh, left pinky on the C and your right pinky on the B, you're already positioned for the e harmonic minor scale that finishes the, the phrase. So, you play the A like this, the G sharp, and then B, right? And then to finish it, had to move anything. So if you play the A like this or the G sharp like this, you have to move at least seven fingers to go to the B. And um, if you do it the, the, the way I just showed you, your hand position has pre-selected the correct notes and eliminated the wrong ones for the entire first phrase. Again, if you play the A like this and you're going for the B and anything can happen. So. Your fingers are your tools. Don't leave them where you last used them. Leave them where you are going to need them next. That's the logic of hand position. There is an, an entire discussion to be had uh, about thinking and practicing in such a way that anticipating correct notes and eliminating wrong ones in your hand position becomes a habit. But I think that's enough for now. If you dig this kind of thing and feel like subscribing in order not to miss future videos, that would be cool. Go get them.